So now on to our, our final speaker of the day. Um, this is Dr. Johnny Ray. Um, Johnny, if you want to share your webcam. He's Chief Technology Officer of eTherapeutics. So Johnny is a computational biologist with a unique background in drug discovery informatics, data science, complex systems analysis, and software and data engineering. Proven architecture, architect and implementer of greenfield computational solutions to complex problems, builder and facilitator of cross disciplinary scientific teams, driven to create novel solutions for the improvement of human health. So eTherapeutics is a drug discovery company and a pioneer in the network-driven drug discovery, a unique, a unique in silico approach to the discovery of medicines. Network-driven drug discovery is a practical application of network biology to drug discovery that aims to apply systems thinking and analysis to the discovery process, with the ultimate aim of reducing the number of late-stage clinical failures due to insufficient biological efficiency. So today, Johnny will be discussing network-driven drug discovery. I will just hand over the screen sharing to you. And again, please you know, feel free to add any questions to the, the question box. And after Johnny's talk, we will bring all the panel back um, to answer questions and to have a, an open table, round table discussion. Uh, thanks, Matt. Can you see my screen okay? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, thanks for the um, thanks for the intro, and uh, and thanks again for the uh, the invite to uh, present at this uh, the, this first webinar. So yeah, as Mac uh, mentioned, my name is uh, Johnny Ray. I'm the CTO at eTherapeutics, and today I would basically like to give you quite a high level, quick overview of the approach that we've been building um, at the company over the last few years um, that we've called here uh, network driven drug discovery. Um, that's uh, you know based on our uh, our take on um, network science uh, and, uh, and their analysis. So very quickly uh, about the company, you know we're based in Oxford, um, roughly 35 people at the moment build, building this approach that you're going to hear about in the, over the last few years. Um, we validated it, and you'll hear more about that later, both internally and in um, collaboration with some external partners. So before I go into um, you know, what we do, I, um, I thought I'd outline the motivations and I think this probably meshes with some of the things that the, uh, some of the previous um, speakers mentioned. Um, you know, I, was, I was going through you know, how best to present this and, and I came across this quote from, um, there was an article um, from Scientific American from you know, about five years ago uh, outlining you know, basically why drugs cost so much. Um, you know, why is the drug discovery process expensive? You know, what is taking all of that time and money to get um, drugs approved? Um, and as you can see there, you know, the the author here summarizes it with you know with one sentence: "It's because biology is complex." Um, and I think it's that key quote there is is you know what's driving the therapeutics to develop our approach. Uh, and hopefully to come up with a novel computational approach to try and address that complexity. You know, just to dive into into this in a, in a bit more detail, um, there's a couple of things that I've outlined here. Um, again, sort of motivations for novel approaches. First, you know, this um, this uh, diagram on the left is a uh, is a figure from a paper from a few years ago that was analysing the you know, the reasons for um, late stage failures, uh, I believe it's from AstraZeneca. Um, and, you know, a large majority of late stage phase two, phase three failures, effectively because the biology that's being targeted uh, is incorrect. You know, we don't know enough about the, um, the biology or the targets that have been identified actually don't modulate the biology of interest or the biology that's being modulated doesn't have an effect on, on the disease. You know, another aspect that plays into this, um, which is actually quite timely, um, given the sort of announcements from yesterday, is you know there's quite a large unmet medical need in in a lot of um, complex disease, and especially you know the complex diseases of aging uh, and dementia and neurodegeneration is is probably the poster child for that. You know, up until yesterday, it was 20 years before 
uh, since the last um, approval for a drug in Alzheimer's. Um, as I say, there wasn't a drug approved yesterday, but I think the general feeling in the industry reading around all the various sort of Twitter posts and, and blog posts today is that um, it's unlikely that it'll actually work. It, you know, it's it, it's been shown to have an effect on amyloid, um, but the actual effect on dementia progression um, is much more questionable. So um, we might have one uh, now, one drug to uh, to help with Alzheimer's, but um, the jury's still out there, I think. Um, and as our population across the world ages, um, it's going to become more, much more of a burden, both on um, you know individuals and families, uh, as well as society in general. Uh, and the final sort of motivation I wanted to to make is a um, you know is a, a, a technology driven one. And again, this is a, a current theme that's I think run through the previous talks. Um, and I, I, I illustrated this I think via this this diagram here, which is you know we've had a massive increase in data over the last decade or so in the biology um, realm. Um, but the ability to actually utilize that data to drive Actional drug discovery approaches um, is 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 lacking, and you know this this illustrates the um, the change over a decade. This these diagrams are chromosome maps of um, SNP trait associations from the GWAS catalog, uh, and as I think you can see, you know, there's obviously been a massive change in the, in the number of um, uh, GWAS data points uh, over that decade, and of course, every other sort of data modality has increased in in similar ways. So. As I mentioned, you know, we've um, th these are some of the motivations that drive what we've been developing at eTherapeutics, um, and I wanted um, to go over a couple of, uh, I guess, foundational, almost theoretical underpinnings of of what we do and the approach that we've developed um, before I go into some of the of the details of what we actually do. So this is where bi uh, networks come in. Um, you know, our approaches are are, are built on top of um, network biology and you know that, that means a lot of different things to different people so this slide aims to get at you know what do we mean by this um it gets at the key problem you know what are we trying to do in drug discovery is to alter phenotype um but by necessity we are manipulating we are intervening at the molecular level at the protein level generally um, and so there's a gap, there's that gap between the, the molecular level and the phenotype level, um, which, is, you know, is probably one of the, you know, the key problems facing modern biology is, you know, how do you bridge that gap? Uh, it's certainly one of the key problems facing early stage drug discovery. Um, and, and we believe that networks actually act as, a, you know, a good gap filler there. So. In the way we've formulated our approach, you can we can view or you should view phenotype not as a property of individual molecules, but rather as an emergent property of mul multiple molecules communicating with each other uh, in a network. It's an emergent property of the molecular networks acting within a cell. Those molecular networks act to impart functional robustness and other properties to phenotype. Functional robust, you know, phenotype we know is, is functionally robust to, to random failures and, and interventions, otherwise, you know, we wouldn't survive, um, or animals wouldn't survive, but at the molecular level, that isn't the case. So something changes between the molecular level and the phenotypic level. Networks exhibit those aspects of functional robustness that phenotypes exhibit, and I'll come back to that in, in a little while. Um, and so, again, we view Mechanistics effectively as a mechanistic network, sorry, as a mechanistic bridge between the genotype phenotype levels. Um, and so by looking for ways of manipulating networks that can represent those phenotypes, um, we can drive a, a sort of mechanistic driven approach to, um, to drug discovery by effectively replacing the idea of looking for things that can manipulate phenotype. To looking at for things that can manipulate networks. The, the other key foundational function I, I wanted to bring out um, is this one: is is how the network view our our network view of the world um, meshes with traditional pharmacology, um, and this is you know shown and illustrated by this sort of toy example on on the left hand side. You know if that cloud down at the bottom represents the networks uh, I've just been talking about that. 
that um, give rise to robust functions. In our case, you know, a robust function of interest. We want to find how we want, you know, we want to find a way of disrupting that robust function. We need to con consider the fact that a um, you know, a drug binding event or a, you know, a drug protein interaction might act distally from that network. Um, basically, amplification, transduction, diversification cascades can link distal um, drug action events via drug targets to a downstream network that gives rise to a function. Um, and that sort of um, action at a distance via um, explicit um, transduction mechanisms um, needs to be taken into account in the um, in, in the analytics and the process and, and, and is in our analytics. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so that sort of outlined, you know, the, the conceptual foundations of, you know, how we how we view the problem of complex biology, how phenotype arises, and how you need to to view the mechanistic un underpinnings of those phenotypes in order to drive drug discovery. So how do we actually turn that into a practical approach um, that, that, that we can use? The first point I wanted to address um, is, you know, what, what do we mean by, you know, networks um, in, in our context? As I mentioned, we, we view these as a, you know, the, 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 the uh, mechanistic networks that are going on in the network. These are made up of um, interactions of different types, four major ones that I've illustrated here. These quite are quite often viewed uh, as separate types of networks within the literature, within structured databases, but in reality, they're, out, they're all going on in the cell at the same time. Um, and so we, we typically will utilize any and all of these as makes sense in a particular context. Um, the other thing I wanted to you know, bring out here is, uh, you know, in addition to the fact that you know, the edges and, and the interactions that we use are you know, mechanistic, molecular molecular interactions within the network. The other point I wanted to bring out is, you know, where do we get our data from um, for these interactions? And it's from a, a, a variety of sources, from the, um, you know, from the most structured, which is, you know, existing databases of observed protein-protein interactions, for example, or other types of interactions. Um, we've also integrated in, interactions that we've um, extracted out using text mining, natural language processing approaches. This is in conjunction with, um, with the Virolate guys. So effectively creating structure from unstructured data from text. Um, and we've also integrated in um, aspects of predicted interactions. So we've, we've done you know, quite a lot of, of exercises where we've asked the question of, you know, where are the big holes in, um, you know, where is the missing data conceptually in, in the various types of interactions and, and, and edges that, uh, you know, that could exist, you know, where are the ones that are missing from the structured data, databases from the, um, from the NLP data? And we've utilized um, machine learning and other predictive approaches to effectively fill in the gaps in those missing data. And, you know, in reality, and in a particular project, we will utilize all three of those approaches historically. Um, and in in, um, in projects that are sort of ongoing at the moment, although I won't go though into them much today, you know we are uh, expanding some of our internal drug discovery work um, into looking at RNAi-based therapeutics, um, and that um, necessitates looking at uh, hepatocyte networks uh, in particular. And so we are looking and, and, and planning effectively cell-specific uh, interaction. Uh, experiments where we can go out and start looking to obtain experimental data around um, reconstructing uh, cell-specific interactions from, um, you, know, you know, from the uh, experimental data that we gather. So once we've, um, you know, gathered those various sources of data, what we end up with is a database um, that is basically a collection of as many observed molecular interactions um, and predicted molecular interactions of the same types uh, that's possible. Um, and this is what we've called the human protein interactome up there at the top. You know, to give you an idea of scale, uh, it covers 
uh, at the moment, you know, most of the human interactome, you know, 20,000 genes are proteins. At the moment, we, we don't differentiate between, between the two. Um, and of the order of, depending on, on, you know, what you include, three quarters to a quarter million um, edges. However, that database, that human protein interaction up at the top there is in no way physiological. It's a, most of the experimental data that measures um, molecular interaction data is done outside of a physiological context. Um, and so we view it as a collection of things that could happen in a particular um, physiological context. And what we've developed are a, a, a suite of network reconstruction algorithms that aim to take that collection of things that could happen and filter it down to a collection of things that we believe are happening in the the area that we're interested in within a, within a particular process. Um, and that, that generally brings in two degrees of specificity. So the first would be a cell type specificity. So, you know, what edges and proteins, et cetera, are there in the cell types we are interested in. Uh, and then the other one is a process specificity. So typically we will be building networks, you know, not of the whole disease cell, but of a sub-process within that disease cell, the process that we are aiming to disrupt with a drug. Uh, and that's how we um, get at the idea of biological specificity with drug action. So our typical disease process networks, again, to give you an idea of scale, are somewhere on the order of 500 to 1,000 proteins. So that's big enough networks to give rise to those robust biological functions that we mentioned, um, but small enough that they're quite specific to that function uh, and, and certainly not the whole cell. Um, so how do we, you know, how do we do this function, um, this reconstruction process? As I mentioned, we have a, a range of algorithms sort of illustrated by those sort of three, three subgraph and icons in the middle there that um, effectively scan a, um, a signal to noise continuum. We have some reconstruction algorithms that are quite accurate, but don't bring in or bring in less of the sort of redundant degenerate pathways um, and other aspects of the network that can be quite critical to um, drug ev drugs evading um, action or the system evading drug action, should I say. Um, on the other hand, we have some other algorithms that um, can bring a lot of those in, um, but also bring a lot of noise in as well. Um, so which ones we use sort of depends on the, um, uh, on the context we're using and the questions that we're asking with those uh, those reconstruction algorithms. Um, and quite often in, in most projects, we will utilize multiple algorithms and and look for um, common answers that don't be, depend on, you know, on, on very specific parameter choice, et cetera. Uh, and in terms of the data that we use to constrain those construction algorithms on top of the human protein interactome, we have two gross camps. Um, it, it's not as black and white as this slide shows, but you know this is illustrative. Um, that I, I, an illustration I think that's quite instructive. So the first on the right hand side is is what we call the knowledge driven approach, and and actually this is where we started uh, in a number of years back, um, because we wanted our approach to be applicable to um, biological processes, bio disease situations where data was hard to come by. Neuroscience is a, is a good example there. It's hard to get biopsy data, for example, from, from, from brains. Um, so, you know, for obvious reasons. So we wanted our approaches to be applicable to situations where there was very little, for example, gene expression measurements from disease, from disease tissue, for example. But there was knowledge known about the underlying biological processes, which proteins, which other molecules were important. We can use that limited knowledge and effectively use our reconstruction algorithms to expand that knowledge out and reconstruct the um, sort of a wider network view of the, the mechanistic underpinnings of those um, processes. On the left hand side, we can also take a um, sort of you know, more hypothesis free approach where we can take data from, for example, disease normal comparisons. Um, that can tell us something about you know, what are the mechanisms that is active in a, um, in a disease state relative to a normal state, and we can reconstruct the, the network representations of those, me those mechanisms 
uh, and utilize those to drive our um, drug discovery processes. Uh, and the various boxes on the left hand side are just the various types of data that we've used successfully to, um, to, to do exactly that. So gene expression, methylation patterns, proteomic data, um, you know, in the recent years using CRISPR screening um, of, you know, relevant knockdowns, A-B comparisons, for example. Um, so once we've, you know, once we've got those um, networks, what do we do with them? So one critical thing I, I, I keep mentioning in here, but, it, but it's important to this step, is that the, you know, these networks represent um, effectively a model of the disease situation that we are trying to perturb. And so like any model, any you know, model of the real system, you can, that's based on, on um, you know, mechanistic underpinnings, you can start to perturb that model and ask what happens. Uh, and that's effectively what our process is based on, uh, is a, a network perturbation analysis. Uh, and rather going, than going into the, the maths, et cetera, of it, I thought I'd illustrate it with a, with a couple of videos. So, and, and these videos illustrate one of the points I made a few slides back that biological networks, along with actually quite a, other, a, a lot of other types of networks, such as the internet, are inherently robust in their, in their structure. They are robust to random perturbations. And what you see on the left-hand side is a network where we randomly perturb the network by removing a certain number of nodes. And you can see there some, some nodes went flying off, you know, into the, um, you know, into the edges of the, uh, uh, you know, of the graph there. But the core structure of that network remained, uh, you know, remained intact. On the right shows what happens if rather than removing and picking those nodes randomly, we actually use some of the analytics we've developed to choose a collection of nodes that we believe are going to be impactful on that network. Um, and if we remove those nodes from the network, a very different pattern emerges. You can see a, a, you know, a much larger um, impact on that, that core network structure. Um, and this is what we mean by perturbation analysis. So, you know, what we've developed are, um, you know, ways effectively of quantifying that difference in perturbation, you know, the left-hand side versus the right-hand side there, of, you know, what happens to that core network structure when we perturb things. What that allows us to do is effectively measure how critical a set of proteins, the collections of proteins is to the network, and then by extension, how critical those sets of no proteins are to the phenotype being modeled by that network. The other critical point that I wanted to bring out here is we've also developed um, a number of statistical null models that are based on you know, effectively taking predictions into the lab and then and seeing what results um, we get. Um, and and you know, those null models effectively address various possible confounding factors. Uh, you know, the usual questions that, that the models address, could you have got this, this result via um, an effect, you know, a, a, um, a, a via a, 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 something that you're not expecting, via some random, um, random change that you, uh, that you define. Um, we don't believe there's one null model that, that, you know, best describes random perturbations, so we, we do this by, um, constructing effectively multiple 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 null models there excuse me so you know once we've you know once we've um, you know, got this idea of, of network perturbation we can do a number of things with it and, and and we've got a number of sort of analytics that we build on and, and processes that we've built on top of um, this concept um, I'm only going to go into one of them um, in, in detail because of time um, but it's also the one that we've investigated the most. Uh, and this is something we call compound impact ranking. And this can be viewed as a, an in silico analysis, analogy, analogy of phenotypic screening um, for those of you who are from the drug industry. So the idea of, you know, around phenotypic screening is, how, you know, how does this compound affect um, a, a phenotype, um, a biological function? So rather than looking for compounds that affect a specific protein target, they're looking directly for proteins that, accept, um, that affect or, or perturb the phenotype or the behavior of interest. 
how we translate that into um, our approach is we're looking for compounds that can affect the network that we believe models the phenotype of interest. So how we do this in practice is we have a, we've built up a, a, an internal compound database, it's got about 15 million compounds in there at the moment, and each compound has associated with it what we call a, a bioactivity footprint. So this is a um, effectively a vector that says, can a compound affect the pro this protein in, in the human proteome? Um, and that vector is made up of um, both of evidence that the, that compound can affect the, the, the protein both in a direct way, does it bind to that protein, and an indirect way, you know, a downstream functional modulation of that protein. And that's actually quite critical at, at, um, for addressing that action at a distance concept that we, we talked about a few slides back. Um, in addition to the empirical data, we actually use machine learning quite heavily um, on this data and a um, you know, we use various machine learning approaches and then ensembling on top of those machine learning approaches to, you know, effectively, again, a bit like the, the interaction data, predict the missing empirical data. Once we've constructed those compounds and their bio, you know, the, the, those compound bioactivity footprints, um, how we utilize this in the in silico screening, the compound impact ranking, is that we simply iterate through every single compound in that database uh, and ask the question, you know, given its its protein bioactivity signature, what is the effect on the network when we perturb that network, much like I showed you in the previous slide, um, based on that, that compound bioactivity footprint? As I mentioned, we can quantify um, that impact. And what's shown on the right-hand side is a graph of those quantification values um, where the Every compound in our in our database has been effectively ranked by uh, its impact on on one particular network in one particular disease pro, uh, concept. A couple of things to note: one is that the x-axis only goes up to uh, twenty-five thousand. As I mentioned, we have multiple million in the database. So what you can see is that the vast majority of compounds have little to no effect on the network structure. They they are effectively randomly perturbing that that network. As, as you would expect. However, there's a small number of compounds, the ones that have higher impact at the y-axis, that have a much bigger impact on the network structure and therefore are predicted to have a much bigger impact on the phenotype that that network models. These are the ones that we're interested in. These are the ones that we then take uh, into the lab uh, and, and then um, validate. And, and I'll show you some validation data in a minute. The one thing I'm not showing here is the thing I mentioned about statistical um, um, measures of is is that is that measured value of, of of network impact different than what we would expect from random, where at random is defined in multiple different ways um, based on potential confounding factors that we've identified from our lab work. So this um, this slide just gives you some validation data, some you know very sort of gross statistics. Uh, and there's a number of points I want to bring out from, from this slide. So the first one is that we've tried to develop our approach to be biology and therapeutic area agnostic. And we've tried to demonstrate this by effectively utilizing the approach in a number of different drug um, discovery programs, both internally and, and with partners. So the... Um, you know, the, the box over on the left hand side there shows the range of biologies and therapeutic areas that we've applied our approach to over the last few years. The, the, the various ones at the top from telomerase um, signaling in oncology down to uh, reversal of T cell exhaustion in immune oncology are the, are the, are the programs that we've, we've run internally. Uh, and then the three at the bottom there are um, the, the areas that we've run in collaboration with um, with Novo, with MSD and Galapagos. Um, one of the key aspects of this approach to um, drug discovery is it allows you to go into the lab with compound decks that are much, much smaller than would typically be done in a, a, a normal lab-based screening approach. Um, and so what this enables, um, the first thing it enables, it enables you to, you know, to go faster and cheaper. Uh, you know, and that's a good thing. 
Um, but to, to my mind, it's, it's maybe not the most interesting thing. The, the more interesting thing is that it allows you to utilize more complex phenotypic cell-based assays at the early stages of drug discovery. Because I think, you know, one of, it's accepted, I think now in the industry that one of our key issues on, you know, that's addressing that, um, that problem of, um, you know, why things are failing late, late uh, in late stages of clinical trials is that some of the early assays that we're utilizing don't translate into what happens in humans. Um, there's been a resurgence in the use of more complex phenotypic assays. However, they don't miniaturize as, as well. You know, they rely on human tissue it can, that, that, that can be quite hard or expensive to get hold of. And so the ability to effectively do your initial wide screen screening of millions of compounds in silico and then take, as can be shown here, hundreds into the lab uh, allows you to use those um, phenotypic assays directly at first. Uh, and, and frankly, this was why the, um, the our three uh, commercial partners were, were interested in working with us. Um, the, the next box over shows our hit rates. So anyone who's worked in, um, you know, in phenotypic screening, you can, we'll see that the, you know, our hit rates are, you know, orders of magnitude higher than what you would normally expect in, um, you know, a blind phenotypic screen. Our definition of a hit is actually quite a high bar. Um, it's confirmed activity at less than 10 micromoles in we generally use actually multiple cell-based assays, multiple phenotypic screens that, that ideally look at orthogonal aspects of the um, of the function that we're trying to perturb. We look for cytotoxicity, you know, do we have just general cell killing? Um, we look for structural QC, you know, you know effectively we are, we're a virtual company, we, we don't have our own internal compound libraries, we, we buy our compounds that we screen from compound vendors, so we check have we bought what we thought we bought, and we do also do some initial freedom to operate at this point. And so our hits basically have to pass all of those criteria. Um, and so we're getting hit rates anywhere between you know, two, two and a half percent and, and over 11%. Um, and then the, the final bar on, on the right hand side shows that we, um, we typically, we, you know, we, we're not honing in on one area of chemical space on one chemotype. We generally actually get more chemotypes than we have results to deal with. Um, in our internal programs, um, you know, the ones that, you know, that are, are the most gone, we've taken a couple of these projects through a hit to lead and lead optimization towards a lead optimization campaign. The, the two that have most progressed are about the um, start of a lead optimization. Um, we filed um, composition of matter patent. We're, we're able to effectively show that we can, we can take these starting points for medicinal chemistry that we've identified through our computational approach. Uh, and drive a an ongoing small molecule discovery uh, program. Um, and the um, you know the graphs in the bottom right there are just um, figures showing some comparison between the numbers of compound screens and our hit rates relative to 15 papers we found on phenotypic screening from from the literature. Uh, and as I mentioned, we're screening about you know two three orders of magnitude less compounds on average, and getting hit rates of, of one or two uh, orders of magnitude higher as well. As I mentioned, because of, of, of time constraints, I've, I've, got, I've only got a chance to go through one of our workflows, and, and that's the one I've gone through previously, which sort of mirrors phenotypic screening. Um, and this is shown on, on these sort of um, these process diagrams uh, on the left-hand side. So if, if you can see my um, my mouse pointer, it's this path through um, the workflow here. But of the over the last few years, we've also identified some, um, also implemented some other workflows, which I'll briefly mention here, but I, you know, I haven't got time to go into the details. The first one, building on, on what we've already, what I've already um, gone over is, you can take active compounds that you identify through the HIT identification um, point in the lab and drive a, a medicinal chemistry campaign, and that's what we've done. You can also use those compounds, however, to do target deconvolution, and, and then take those targets into other therapeutic um, developments, such as um, you know, a target-driven um, small molecule program, or you know, what we're developing internally, an RNAi modality, for example. 
building on top of the same network construction modules and the same network construction algorithms uh, and that concept of impact and, and action at a distance, we've also generated um, analytics that get at effectively key protein and, and key target nomination approaches where we can identify proteins sort of upstream of those networks of interest um, that are likely to have a large effect, a large impact on the um, on the network of interest. Uh, and then we can utilize those um, targets via target validation approach, again, to drive therapeutic programs. Uh, and then the final process, the one on the right hand side that we've um, developed is more geared towards providing genetic support um, and potentially using genetic data to drive a drug discovery process. And, and, and what we've focused on here um, is the idea that, um, you know, in the, the you know, the genetic, uh, in, in the genetic world, it's sort of, there's a continuum between, um, you know, monogenic disease, um, you know, rare disease generally, all the way through to complex disease where, the genetic associations can be made up of tens if not hundreds of, of, of genes and in the last case in complex disease the use of, of genetic data to actually drive you know actual drug discovery uh, processes um, you know, has, has been much much harder to to come by and has been a bit of a, a sort of pushback in the, in the recent few years of you know what is what is GOS actually gaining gaining us in um, in, a, in a drug discovery uh, context so we've utilized our network concepts of being able to put such GWAS data into a network context and, and use those um, network construction, network analysis approaches to effectively identify key biological processes that drive susceptibility to disease, um, to disease progression in late stage complex disease, and then utilize that to drive either target identification or to provide genetic support for targets identified via the other the other workflows. Uh, and in an ideal project where we've, we've got a couple of these now, we would typically do all three if such data exists, uh, you know, and start to look for um, you know endpoints there that where we have evidence from all three streams. Very briefly. I've sort of you know hinted at a, a lot of this over over the, the previous slides um you know we've built up a an internal um computational platform that 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 um that you know basically um constructs all of the databases and the various data integration pipelines that utilizes those those various databases in our network construction that allows our disease biologists our non-informatics experts to actually run these processes in an automated manner, um, uh, you know, and we have quite a, you know, a wide extensive uh, platform that we, we've developed uh, over the last few years, and that effectively what, what my job's been in, in, in developing the, you know, that platform in the last few years. You know, on top of that, and I've, you know, I've hinted at this a couple of times, is that we've, um, you know, we've taken a lot of uh, uh, our predictions into the lab in real drug discovery processes, uh, and, you know, and effectively validated and then driven real drug discovery processes based on our predictions. But then we've also feed, fed those results back into, you know, improving the, in, improving, improving the platform, improving the analytics, um, you know, based on those results. Uh, and then the final piece of, um, you know, the four pillars of our, uh, you know, our, uh, our network biology platform, um, you know, is the people and the experience that we, we've gained. You know, we've learned a lot, a lot of lessons over the last decade or so of how to think about complex disease in, in a systems way, how to actually, you know, drive a real project, um, you know, from here's the disease context we're interested in, how do I actually go about addressing this uh, in this manner? Um, and, uh, you know, and, and that now is sort of in, it's both embedded in the people and embedded in, in quite a lot of the cases in the, um, the automated processes that we've developed. So just a summary, um, you know, we based our uh, drug discovery approach on building mechanistic models of the biological processes we're interested in. And then we utilize perturbation analysis to effectively test, you know, min millions of, of potential biological therapeutic uh, hypotheses. Our approaches are disease and modality agnostic. Um, 
and we've built a modular platform that enables multiple validated workflows, which now includes small molecule discovery, including target deconvolution. Uh, it includes a, you know, a target-driven discovery approach and uh, a functional genomics or GWAS analysis that aims to, to give genetic support to, um, to the, the targets and the small molecules we, we discover using the other, the other workflows. Consistently observed success across multiple programs. Um, and a couple of things that you know, we're, we're, we're doing right now is um, you know, in the last year, we, you know, we've developed our own internal and um, proprietary RNA delivery platform you know, based on some of the, um, you know, the, some of the, um, the new people that have, have come into the, the company over the last year or so uh, and their expertise. Uh, and a belief that there is a, um, uh, you know, a couple of things to be to be gained from that, from you know, from the the res from the um, aspect of of the RNAi as a, a therapeutic modality, uh, it allows us to to effectively you know get to the clinic um, in a much you know quicker way in theory than small molecules do, um, and within the um, you know within the liver and in the hepatocyte area. There, you know, there is a um, you know, quite a big opportunity for novel target, novel therapeutic hypothesis generation, which we believe we can apply our um, our platform to. Uh, and as I mentioned, you know, we have multiple third-party validations achieved through um, various partners with partnerships with various bio biopharma companies uh, in in different therapeutic areas. And um, and that's actually all I I wanted to say. Thanks for listening.